Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? We're back with another episode. This is yep, the yep, Class yep. In Session Podcast. Listen to me, guys. We on a roll right now. Do you hear me? And we appreciate everybody that's uh, jumping on this train with us, but we're literally on a roll. So I want to say this is the Class In Session Podcast. I am your host, Logan Taylor, with my amazing co-host, my partner in crime, my brother, Mr. Dante Hampton. And we got a special guest for you all, Dante all right guys so we have uh mr seth warren with us today uh he's coming all the way speaking with us um from pennsylvania um he's currently at uh, assistant assistant middle school principal in Cary, north carolina uh he's 30 years old this is his eighth year in education and his third year as a assistant principal which means he has a ton of experience which is always good um he also currently works at one of the top magnet schools in the country and they're one of the largest districts in the nation, but they're the biggest district in North Carolina for, as well. Um, he's facilitated countless P PDs, uh, which is professional development for teachers and experienced a lot of levels. Um, he just enjoys um, doing different strategies and things of that nature. Um, self, welcome aboard, man. Can you give our listeners a little bit more about yourselves and uh, just explain how you even got into education before even becoming an AP, uh, as well as being a teacher or anything like that. Can you just give us a little feedback? Yeah, absolutely. First, thanks for having me on, guys. Like I said, I've been uh, watching the podcast. I like watching my YouTube, so you guys are doing a great thing. It's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, but like you guys said, I'm from, originally from Pennsylvania. I uh, made my way down to North Carolina. It was tough to get a teaching job up in Pennsylvania. Um, I was a store manager at Finish Line, the sneaker store, and I knew that wasn't a career that I was going to have. Um, so after I graduated from uh, Penn State, I decided to go to a job fair. It was at a local university. The only schools I wanted to work at were in Pennsylvania. I happened just to walk by the North Carolina section. Um, a guy asked me if I played basketball or wanted to coach. I said, yeah, I played basketball. It's my passion. Love doing it. He said, why don't you come down to North Carolina for an interview? Three days later, I made the made the six and a half, seven hour trip from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, down to Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. They offered me the job. Uh, I accepted. A week later, I was moving into an apartment down in North Carolina. Uh, with She was my girlfriend, but now she's my wife. Um, and just growing up, uh, education is always something I wanted to do. Uh, I knew the NBA wasn't going to work out for me. I was OK at basketball, not great. So I knew NBA wasn't going to happen. But um, I had some great teachers in high school. I had some OK teachers in high school. But um, the thing that really got me was um, I was in an AP English class uh, and another athlete was in there with me and we were just talking before class started. It was the first day of school and a teacher said to me and the other young man that was with me goes, she goes, I got some dumb jocks in this class. Like didn't know me, didn't know him, like didn't know anything about us and just completely, I mean, put us out like that in front of everybody. Wow. And from that moment on, I'm like, there's got to be a better way. Like th this isn't how this isn't how education's supposed to be. People aren't supposed to feel like this. Um, and ever since that point, I'm like, this is it just reaffirmed what I wanted to do. So coming down to North Carolina, it was always my goal. It was always my dream to work in a Title One school. That's my that was my passion. Um, the road led me from Roanoke Rapids to Athens Drive, uh, where I finished my master's there. I did my admin internship there, and then I bounced to Reedy Creek Middle School. Uh, that was the first middle school I ever worked at. I love every second of being at Reedy Creek. It's it's home now. Uh, so like I said, that's where I've been the last couple of years. Um, I'm the sixth grade assistant principal there. And we're one of the top magnet schools having a great time. It, it's an amazing place to be. I love it. I love it. First, I want to say oh, shout out to the wife. That's am, that's amazing. I know you said girlfriend at the time. So shout out to Miss Warren. If she's uh, in the building and she's, you know, hopefully when she listens to this. So shout out to Miss Warren and give her um, her flowers. But um, yeah, man, that's that's amazing, man, to know that you you left your hometown. Right. So you left where you were comfortable at and to go to a space where you didn't know anybody um, and to be, you know, willing to take that risk and to be uncomfortable. So I, I really appreciate, you know, you answering that calling uh, for our babies uh, in, you know, working in Wake County and things of that nature. Uh, for our listeners that don't know, he's actually in North Carolina and Wake County is the 14th largest school district in the country. They have over 160,000 students. 
um, and a little over 200 schools. And so that should give you, you know what I'm saying, a little idea of where he is and, uh, you know, and what he's doing um, over there in North Carolina. So, Seth, let me ask you, um, what is one piece of advice you would give to someone that's wanting to start out um, in the career of being in the education space? So look at it kind of from the teacher lens. I think the biggest thing that somebody getting into education, especially if they want to be a teacher, uh, they have to be curious. That's a big thing. You got to be curious when I work, I'm working with new teachers or somebody who is a student teacher. I tell them all the time, be curious, ask all the questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to try something new in your classroom. Uh, I, I love young educators who come in and ask questions about pedagogy, who ask questions about classroom management. I love curious people in general. I think another thing is that to be in education today, you have to be flexible. I love the quote, fair is not always equal. Everybody comes into the classroom thinking I'm gonna treat every kid the same. That's not always the case. Backgrounds have to be taken into account. Um, learning abilities have to be taken into account. So be flexible. Uh, and probably the biggest piece of advice I can give is to get into other teachers' classrooms. I'm a huge advocate for teachers learning from teachers. Uh, I, when I was starting out, I mean, you couldn't get me out of my colleagues' classrooms when I was a new teacher. That My principal would always see me during my planning periods in somebody else's classroom uh, because I wanted to see. I wanted to see what was going on. I wanted to see how they handled different situations. Uh, and Roanoke Rapids was a Title I school. So being from Pennsylvania, I had never been south of Richmond in my life. I was, it was a completely different world. So getting into other classrooms helped me a lot. So by being curious, getting into other classrooms, and don't come into school with an ego. Uh, I see a lot of educators in some spaces get a little arrogant. We're not in this for trophies. We're not in this for awards. We're in this for helping kids. That, that's, that's our trophy. That's, that's what we're fighting for every day. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. And sometimes your ego, your confidence might get hurt a little bit, but don't be afraid to ask for help. Like check that ego at the door when you walk in in the morning, you make a mistake, ask for help a lesson bombs, ask for help. I'd rather a teacher, now that I'm an administrator, come to me and say, hey, Seth, listen, whatever's happened first period, it just didn't work. Can we sit down real quick and we'll go over everything I just did and we can fix it? So I, I love that. I love curious new teachers. Um, we're starting to get a little more lateral entry teachers, people who have a, other careers and now want to get into education. Um, and I think that's one thing they're great at is asking a lot of questions. I think that's something that, um, just that older generation of teachers, they're asking questions, they're curious, they want to see um, what other people are doing. And I think those are the most successful teachers, the ones that check that ego at the door and are willing to say, you know what, I need help. Like, show me, help me, get me resources. Those are the new teachers that are often pretty successful. I love that. I love that. Being curious, being curious. You said you, you love new educators that come in and love to be curious and that's 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 amazing and then also you know like you said like having people that coming from a different a different career path right like we have some we have brought on some guests that they've had different career paths for example um the episode that dropped our number our fourth episode uh with uh mr felix beasley he used to be a banker for 20 years before crossing over into education and now he's been teaching for eight years. And so I think, you know, people like that, or, you know, we have another episode where uh, a lady was a teacher, she was an ELA teacher and she crossed over to be an entrepreneur. And so I think being able to have those different dynamics, like I think stuff like that is important because you can relate to our babies, at least I feel like um, in a more effective way, right? You can show them, other avenues or other other um uh, you can show them yeah you can show them other avenues and career paths outside of what a textbook may tell you yeah that's the most important thing i think it's great when people change career paths and it leads them into education um, especially when teachers or individuals have done something in the business world i mean they have great ideas it's a completely different space in education um, but they prepare students for what life is like outside of school. They can tell them what vocations can do for them. Um, we here at my school, we have a pretty decent sized CTE department, career technical education department. We have quite a few lateral entry teachers in there. And, and those teachers have the most amazing relationship with kids because 
they're human. Like they, they show, they know that they did something before teaching and they're curious about it. So uh, I have a ton of respect for people who are willing to make that career change. And I listened to Mr. Beasley's podcast on my way home uh, this afternoon. And it was great. It, the passion is there. I mean, we went from banking, mentoring, and then to being a classroom teacher, you could just hear his passion. And I, I, when you have a calling to work with children, you have a calling to work with kids, you, you got to open that door. You got to answer that call. That's not something that ever leaves you. You, you got you got to answer that because that means you're called to help somebody that needs it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dante, come on, man, jump in. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just turning my volume up a little bit, make sure y'all can hear me. Um, but my, my question to you is, um, how do you, what's the day-to-day -day like for you as a, as a, for those out there who don't know, what's the day-to-day -day for an assistant principal on the sixth grade level, just for our parents and for some of our listeners who might not know? Yeah, it, it, every day is different as a sixth grade assistant principal. Um, when I first started in this job, at least as assistant principal, I kept a to-do list. Um, and I realized a lot of stuff on that to-do list wasn't getting done on a day-to-day -day just because it, it's, it's a difficult job. Things happen 24 seven. Um, so, but day-to-day, -day, like I said, I handle the transportation for the school. So I'm out there with the buses, trying to greet the kids, make that early connection with them. Uh, just make sure they see somebody. And we have other administrators at the carpool uh, section doing the same thing. Every administrator tries to be out there with the kids, smiling, fist bumps, connecting with parents, connecting with bus drivers, that, that we really take that seriously because that's our that's our spot to start their day off with a smile and a, and a positive uh, fist bump conversation, just, just exchange positivity is a great way to start the day. Uh, for me personally, and I take great pride in getting into classrooms. Um, it, it's difficult some days, uh, but one of my friends, uh, he, he always drops this quote, what you prioritize is a priority. So getting into classrooms, is my priority. So I prioritize that. Um, if I'm having a bad day, if I start off on a bad note, my morning doesn't go well. Nothing makes me happier than getting into a classroom, sitting with students and just helping them with whatever they're working on. Um, but probably the most difficult part of the job is those days where I have to do a lot of those managerial tasks that kind of takes me away from the classroom. It's a part of the job. We do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, um, things that Nobody ever really knows that we we do. Like I said, I, I handle transportation. So there's a lot that goes into that behind the scenes. Um, but I think parents and teachers and community members, uh, I, I think the school functions at a high level because it takes everybody to do it. So once we get the kids in the classroom in the morning, like we trust our teachers 100 uh, percent. Reedy Creek has some of the best educators I've ever seen. My main goal is to let them teach. Like get the kids in the classroom and, and let them shine, let them do their thing because we have so many talented teachers. Um, but like I said, we do a lot of behind the scenes stuff as assistant principals. We have to support the principal and his vision, his mission for the school. We have to support the teachers. We handle discipline. I mean, we are we're the ones that um, do a little bit of everything. And that's why I wanted to be assistant principal. I know there's some teachers um, that kind of shy away from being an administrator because they think it's all discipline. And some days it is all discipline. But. I get to pop into every classroom. I get to meet parents all the time. I get to make positive phone calls home. I get to see kids all over the building with those light bulbs going off. If the kid's having a bad day, I, I get to fix it sometimes. And all the assistant principals I work with, uh, Ms. Collins and Ms. Dorsey do the same thing. That's why I love where I'm at because some days were the, the discipline, some days were the mentor, some days were the shoulder to cry on. Assistant principals are lucky because we get to do everything. It's, it's an awesome job. That's that's real good. That's real good. I like that prioritize right there. I, I like that quote. What was that quote again? You said you prioritize, One more time for our listeners. Pri you prioritize what's a priority. Gotcha. So if get, getting into classrooms is a priority for me. I'm going to prioritize it to make sure that I can get in there and uh, support my teachers. Like so I, I try to be and my sixth grade teachers get sick of hearing me say it, I'm sure. But I'm their biggest cheerleader, uh, I, I think. And again, the two other assistant principals I work with, Miss Dorsey and Miss Collins, they're the same way. We are cheerleaders for our teams. We love to shout from the mountaintops what they do. So we make that a priority to get into their classrooms as much as we can. A absolutely. T teacher support is um, is needed and it's very, very, very important. Um, like I say, everybody feels underappreciated. Um, do you 
do you agree with the perception of uh, teachers and as far as administrators in general? Do you agree like the perception as far as principals being just like kind of like mediators and delegating things or teachers just basically being what you call in today's time uh, babysitters? So I, I think administrators today get kind of miscategorized. What we're seeing is the disciplinarians or the people people think we're disciplinarians. That's a part of my job, but it is not all I do every single day. Um, like we had our open house last night, met all my new sixth graders and parents kept saying, oh, you better not go to his office when you're in trouble. That's who you're going to see. Right. I made I made sure the kid knows, no, like my job is to make sure you're successful. You're having a bad day. Come see me. You need something. Come see me like discipline. Hey, it's your sixth grade. You're going to make mistakes. If you got to see me for discipline. We'll work through it together. Um, but like I said, I, I, I try to be there for whatever they need. So I think at least from when I was in school, the assistant principal was the person who handled discipline. Like maybe it's an older view of what the assistant principal was, but I think the position has evolved. I think it's evolved because it, it needs to. So students need more support. Families need more support. Communities need more support. And I think assistant principals get to do all those things. Um, so the position has evolved. And I think that's something that the general public may not understand is that we can get resources. I may not be a counselor. I may not be a social worker, but I know the people to call. I know the contacts. I know who to reach out to. I, I can get people support that they need. Uh, I'm not just the guy who calls when your kid messes up or skips class. Like that's not my only hat. Um, and, and I think in general for teachers too, I think the public may think that when that bell rings at three o'clock, whenever the school day's over and during summers that we don't think about their kids. Uh, I mean, I think about students that I had eight years ago what happened to them? Where are they at? I mean, they're they're adults now. What are they working? Have they started families? I love when one of my when I was the varsity coach at Roanoke Rapids, I love when my players text me, say, hey, coach, this is what's going on. Or, hey, coach, just checking up on you. We have a conversation. Um, but I don't think the general public realizes that on those drive home, like for teachers, they're thinking about their kids. Like they're wondering what they're going home to if they, they were crying in class today. Like what could have been done differently? Um, so I think the general public needs to understand that we call them our kids for a reason. It's not just because it's a kid in the classroom, but for a vast majority of educators, we spend more time with other people's kids than we do our own kids. So we wonder what happens to them during the summers. We wonder what happens to them when they go home. We wonder what happens to them on the weekend. We shed tears for other people's kids. So I know educators get a bad rap and look at babysitters, uh, look, looked at as babysitters, but when we go home at the end of the day, we're thinking about a lot of kids and what, what's going on in their lives and, and are they okay? That, that's real good. That, that's real. That's, that. that's real good. So for our listeners out there, man, make sure y'all understand that a lot of these administrators out here, um, it's a lot of moral support that they're giving and the position has evolved. Um, and me personally, my personal opinion is just simply that um, administrators now is more so it's like a CEO, like you have to touch every single person in the building and they have a lot of responsibility, especially with the way kids learn now with social media and everything. I think it's very vital um, that you do that. And yeah, that's just my opinion on it. But go ahead, Lo. Seth, let me ask you. So with being in education, um, we said what, eight years now, is that correct? Yes, sir. How have you been able to have that work life balance, right? Like I know, I know, you know, of course, when you I'm and I'm pretty sure you're probably guilty of this when I say this, that as a when you were a teacher, you was taking work home and you know what I'm saying, and things of that nature, working, you know, multiple hours, putting in, you know, those over over 40 hours, 40, 50 hours a week. How were you able to sustain right that work life balance? As a teacher early on, I, I'll admit I struggled with it. Um because being a new teacher in a new state, in a new community, um, taking that work home was kind of my way to help just the stress of being somewhere else. Luckily, like I said, that's why I married my now wife. Um, because like I said, she, she Carolina with me. So uh, I decided that she was going to be Mrs. Warren. She was my rock there too. I think it was making time for her. Um, doing things that I enjoy, but I was terrible at um, work-life balance starting out. 
I, I was really bad at it. Uh, and I had a veteran teacher there. I uh, got to give a shout out to Mr. Bridgers. He taught at Roanoke Rapids High School forever. And he said, man, you got to leave your stuff here. Like you got to use your planning period better. You have to, you have to find what works for you. Come in a little bit early. Like when nobody's here to bother you, don't come in too early, but come in here early, work a little bit. When nobody can bother you, you can't get pulled. That way you don't have to take it home um, at the end of the night. So I struggled with it early, um, but I had to figure out what works for me. I know some teachers like to work at night. Some teachers just did all the grading on weekends. Um, so I had to figure out what worked for me. I had to do some reflection on how I was planning lessons. I mean, when I started teaching AP government, they're writing all those long AP essays and I was grading morning, noon, night, any free minute I had. So I had to plan smarter too. Um, and as I evolved into an administrator um, and the process of becoming an administrator was tough. I was the varsity basketball coach going through grad school to get my master's degree. And my wife was pregnant. Um, she was nine months pregnant uh, in literally the middle of basketball season. My daughter was born January 1st, uh, 2019. And my wife was pregnant. She came to a holiday tournament with us um, the three hours away from the school. And that's after that, it hit me that I need to find a better work-life balance. Like that was my, that was my big wake up call because my, my wife came with me to a basketball tournament three hours away from our house, nine months pregnant. And I mean, that, that, that was no way to live just, uh, between grad school teaching, supporting my wife, it, it, it was tough. Um, but I think it's all about finding what works for you and asking people who've been doing it longer. If I didn't have a Mr. Bridgers telling me early on, like find out works for you, come in a little bit early. Um, grade smarter, use your planning periods better. If I'd have somebody like that, I don't know how long it would have taken me to break that cycle. Um, and like I said, I think for every educator, they need to, again, prioritize what's a priority and your mental health, your well-being has to be number one. We give all day, we give everything we have every single day. I tell my sixth grade teachers all the time, you can't pour from an empty glass. So when that glass starts to get empty, how can you fill somebody else's glass up when yours is, you don't got anything left in it. So again, it, it's tough, but you got to rely on your people. You got to reach out to people when you need help. You have to plan smarter. You have to create lessons that um, don't drag you down. Because what I mean by that is don't focus on big grandiose things that may take two, three weeks to grade because every kid's writing a 10 page paper. Like be smart about it. Have kids create things. Maybe be smart about how you create rubrics. Um, again, lean on other teachers who've been doing it. And that's why I said at the beginning of this, check that ego at the door because don't act like you know everything. Education should be collaborative. Whether it's teachers or students, it needs to be collaborative. If teachers in a school have their door shut all day and they're not having those conversations, those new teachers are gonna get burnt out. And the older teachers won't be exposed to new ideas the younger teachers have, so they're gonna be stressed out. So keep those doors open, interact with each other, check that ego at the door, go talk to a colleague, say, I'm staying here till eight o'clock at night. What do I need to do? So just, be humble enough to ask for help and ask help of those who know better. He said collaboration over competition, y'all. I hope y'all caught that. He said collaboration over competition. So for those of you that are in the education space and you keep that door closed and you're not being humble and you got that ego, I need you to listen. I need you to humble yourself and you need to ask for some people to give you some help and some some direction and things of that nature. That's good. I, I really appreciate that. That was really, really good, Seth. I really appreciate that. Uh, but before we get into the next question, which is our hot seat question, we got some bills we got to pay real quick. Um, and then Dante will come in and ask the hot seat question, okay? That's hey, good. guys, listen. This is the Class In Session podcast. I'm going to say it one more time in case y'all didn't hear me. This is the Class In Session podcast. And I need y'all to do a few things for us, okay? I need you to like, subscribe, and comment, all right? I need you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment, all right? And listen, if you love what we're doing, you love the value that we're, at, that we're adding, please share it with your network, all right? And leave us a review. You leaving a review is so important to us, and it helps us, all right? So again, this is the Class and Session podcast, and make sure that you like, subscribe, and comment. Dante, it's on you. All right, all right, all right. 
All right, Mr. Warren. So here, here's what we got here. So since you're AP, you know, assistant principal, um, we asked everybody this. There's no right or wrong answer. You can um, say however you feel. Like I said, this is open, open answer right here. There's no wrong answer. Um, but is there a number, if there is a number or a value you can put on uh, teachers for to be paid in the U.S. Now you can say whatever number you feel, however you want to. I know you work in the largest district, so it may vary. And then we'll come back and tell you what we think and what we say. Um, but if there is a number or a value, you think teachers should be paid? I do not think any number would be sufficient. Um, and what I mean by that is if we're going to revamp how we look at education and how we respect and appreciate educators, money isn't just enough. We need to support the emotional, social well-being of our teachers. We need to make sure teachers have support because teaching can get a little lonely. If you're in a, in a Title I school or even if you're in a big school in Wake County, it doesn't matter where you are, this profession can get lonely from time to time. So we need to make sure that our teachers and our educators have that mental health support. I think um, insurance wise, the benefits packages, we need to make sure that the families can be taken care of too. Like I know where I am in North Carolina, um, to add my family is unbelievable. Like it's mind blowing how expensive it is to add my, to my son, my daughter, and my wife to my insurance. Like it, it blows my mind every month when I look at it. Um, and I, I think it also goes to respecting teachers' time. Uh, I'm a big advocate for, uh, for those four day teaching weeks. That fifth day should be devoted to professional development, should be devoted to all the meetings that teachers would have to stay after school for because teachers are parents too. Edu educators are parents too. They gotta get to daycare. They wanna see their kids. If we could find a way as a nation, I know some states are doing it, which is great, but if we could find a way to incorporate that four day week where maybe the school day is a little bit longer, but teachers are teaching for four days and they have that middle of the week or end of the week, however it's framed, just to devote to grading, to professional development, to collaboration, um, team building, knocking out all those meetings, that would show an unbelievable amount of respect to educators. Because again, there are some days we have meetings a couple of days a week or some weeks we have meetings several times. Um, so teachers are staying after they're having to figure out who's going to pick up the kids. So yes, teachers have summers off, but they're still devoting those summers to professional development. They're still devoting those summers to improving their practice. So I don't think there's a number to attach to it because I think it's, it has to be revised as a whole. Compensation is a big part of it. Teachers who have master's degrees should be paid for master's degrees. Uh, I know some states don't do that. North Carolina got rid of it a few years ago. Teachers should be paid if they have a master's degree. They should be, that's showing respect. Like that's improving your craft, that's sharpening your sword. We should want our teachers to go back and get that advanced degree, uh, pay them for it, treat them like the professionals they are, uh, support their families better by giving them benefits packages that doesn't kill their paycheck. Um, make sure that we're supporting their social, emotional health, their well being by providing them with community supports. Um, and I think a big thing too is whatever we can do to get the community more involved in the schools. Uh, we have a great PTA at Reed Creek. I mean, best I've ever seen. They do everything for us. I love them to death. Not every school has that. I mean, we had lunch provided by them today. We had breakfast when all the teachers came back. They take care of us in more ways than I can describe. Not every school does that. But the community is so important to what happens in the school. So again, to put a number on it, I think would be doing a disservice to teachers everywhere because I've worked in a Title I school and now I'm in the biggest district in North Carolina. I've been on both sides in the state. Um, and I think just making a number or any percentage on a paycheck, I think that's leaving out the other side of it. And some states I see are making it beyond easy to become a teacher, removing basically all barriers to being a teacher. Uh, and I, again, I think that devalues the teachers who are already in the profession who've worked hard, did the student teaching, which is difficult no matter who you are, got the four-year degrees, or lateral entry who spent 10, 15 years in a career, jumped into education, went through the whole path. I think everybody should have the opportunity to work with kids if it's in their heart, 
Um, but I think by just eliminating all the barriers in general, I think you're looking at the teachers who've been doing this for a while and saying, hey, you know what, we're not, we're not going to pay you. There's a ton of vacancies. So we're just going to bring in whoever. So like I said, to answer your question, I don't think there's a number because I think a number would take away from everything else that needs to be fixed to fully uh, show respect to our educators. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, that's sort of a little different. Um, we had somebody that said they couldn't give a number, but not from your perspective. Um, I really liked it, the basically not adding value pretty much by putting a number on you devalue. So basically you're downgrading the status quo, you say, of a teacher or educator. Um, for me, I'm big on essentials. My thought process is with the way the rates, they could stay the same. I just feel like it should be some kind of programs out there for automobiles, um, housing, um, and like you said, insurance, of course. Um, that's what I was big on is I feel like no matter where you move, like if you're 23 or you're 34, I think there should be tiers of housing. I think if they had some kind of like, kind of like how they have a, uh, what is it, a first, first home buyer deal, whatever. If they got something like that in place for teachers, um, I think that will make a big difference as well because everybody needs that security, that support. So if it doesn't work out, hey, I stay in this home five years, it doesn't work out. I can at least have some kind of asset to bounce back. And then, of course, everybody needs a, a vehicle. So if you're in New York, you still have need a vehicle, whether you're taking the subway or whatever. But Logan, I'm sure Logan, you you might love a Logan answer. So <laughs> listen, y'all already know what I'm gonna say because I listen. I listen. I I feel like our teachers need to be paid what doctors and lawyers are being paid. And he just said this on every every episode, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm more, so just so you know. No, I've heard. I've listened to every episode, so I, I've heard it. Yeah, I know exactly what he's getting ready to say. You no, know, he already know what I'm gonna say. Eighty thousand. That's my number. I feel like I feel like that should. You know, I mean, it's like I've all. It's like I've always said. Like, how can you be a teacher, and you only get paid for thirty seven and a half, maybe forty hours, depending on you know what I'm saying the state guidelines for teaching but you do 50 to 60, 70 hours a week. And they only pay you for 35 and a half or 40 hours. You could go to T-Mobile. You could go to, uh, you can go work at the airport. You can go work somewhere else and they're going to start paying you time and a half after that 40 hours. And so I feel like, well, why can't my, why can't our teachers, why can't our teachers get that benefit? Right. And so, I, you know, it's like, it's not fair. Like we say that, you know, we value our teachers. They are the, the you know, they are the ones that help people become lawyers and, you know, uh, doctors and entertainers and, you know, all those different things. And it's like you still want to pay them. Thirty six thousand, twenty eight thousand, forty thousand, maybe in a bigger state. Right. And I just feel like that's not fair. And so I feel like, hey, start them off at the bottom, right? The bottom bare minimum, start them off at 80,000 to show like, hey, listen, we value y'all. That I feel like that's a starting point, right? And with that 80,000, like Dante said, you have these programs, right? That's even more value that we're adding on top of that, right? And then also, you know, I also feel like even with the mental health, like teachers need mental health days, right? Because they're dealing with so much. So I feel like for me, I'm like, hey, listen, if, if I was the, the the Department of Education and I was over it and I was a secretary, I'm starting every teacher off in all 50 states. Y'all starting off at 80000 That is going to be your base pay salary. And then we're going to go up from there. But you do know the cost of living is higher. So you're going to have to skew that. So if you in New York, I got friends that live in New York, 80K, you might have to probably bump that to like 100. Well, so I know. feel like I, I look at it like this. So yes, we can say. And, and know, don't forget York, San Diego is. We can, San Diego we can talk is about that, right? Like we can talk. Okay, so New York is, the cost of living is high. California, the cost of living is high, right? We also know in other big cities that the cost of living is high, right? However, an educator in New York, they may be making what? 60 65 maybe maybe right so starting out what can you do with an extra 15 or twenty thousand, right and then think about like 
we had a teacher. She said in 1993, her salary for a year was $20,000. What? Well, I think my question is then to throw back to you guys. So say we may, say we started at the $80,000 and just kind of playing devil's advocate. If we start at $80,000 and somehow we get everybody on board saying, okay, base teacher can make in the United States is 80,000. Do you think it becomes harder than in the future to get other things done for teachers? Like say, knock on wood, another pandemic happens. Something happens, it shakes up our whole world. And we, then we, have, we realize again that teachers are doing more than what could ever be asked. Do you think raising it that high, if it would happen, would make it harder to do other things for teachers? Or do you think it would wake everybody up and say, look at the quality of people we're bringing in now. Look at how many people are going to college to be teachers. How does that shake out? I feel like, so that's a that's a loaded question. And the reason why I say that is because I feel that to answer your question, yes, I do feel like now you'll start to get some better candidates that want to work in the education space. There, there are some people like when, like for you, for example, when you jumped into education, it was because you had a passion for it. It had nothing to do with money. Right. I feel like every person that jumps into education is because they have a passion behind it. This is your calling. This is your purpose. When you when you wake up in the morning, you're trying to figure out how can I impact the next generation's life in a positive way. So for me, I feel like, yes, absolutely. Let's start there. And of course, you know, you have teachers that have been teaching for 20 years, 30 years and things of that nature. And so those teachers that have been teaching, right, like on another episode, um, we had a lady and she was talking about how teachers get paid specifically from the salary of where they started at. So if they're based, if they were getting paid 30000 in 1990, that's what they're going to base their uh, increase off of is what it was in 1990. And so for me, I'm like, yo, like, no, we need to show teachers that they matter. We need to show them that they value, that we value them. And I feel like that's moving in the right direction. So to answer your question for me, yes, I feel like, yes, you will start to get better candidates and things of that nature. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that would definitely raise the quality of candidate. And I think, it, like, to your point earlier, look at teachers, we look at doctors, lawyers, the professionals that we go to when we need something, we trust them as professionals. No, I, I agree 100% that I think it would raise a quality candidate and put put a new level of respect on who educators are as people. But but also, though, I think you're going to get some people in there who necessarily want, want to be a teacher, but it doesn't financially make sense. Like for me, in a perfect world, I would love to be a teacher. I mean, you off during the summer, it works. But financially, I got into logistics so fast that it never, like, it's just not going to match up. Like, I played play ball, played college ball. It just didn't work. Like, by the time I got out, was able, I could do internships and everything. But it's like, I'm not going back to school. I already have a bachelor's degree. I have two degrees, actually. It's just not going to work. And so I think if you bump that up, you will have people out there who will consider it and you will be able to weed people out that will really be like, OK, this is not for me. But to, to also I got a double question for you, though, since we're right here, Low, since we're right here. So since we're talking about changes and things, if there's one thing you can change in the U.S., right, let's say we had. Department of Education for United States of America. Mr. Warren, hey, there's one thing you can change and we're going to dot it down. Like This is going to be set in stone for the whole U.S. What will it be? Now, you can say whatever you want. This has been asked a few times as well. So, Now, I think the biggest thing is the standardized tests. We need, we need to revisit what we're doing with standardized testing. Um, Talk again, about it. Talk about it. Listen, I don't know how long we got, but we can go on for hours with this one. Uh, I'd love to have the Secretary of Education right here. We could jot that down because, I mean, it, for me personally, like I said, I worked at a Title I school, um, low-income students there, great community. Um, but those students are taking the same test that students in the wealthiest areas in the state are taking. And they may have different experiences, um, different supports. 
better access to community resources. Uh, so them taking the same test and then trying to judge the schools based off of scores, it, it always struck a chord with me. Um, even the last couple of years with everything that's going on, like, again, here in North Carolina, like I could have a kid score a one or a two on an EOG, but that kid may not have been able to academically do basic things. Yeah, they may only got a one or two on a test, but that doesn't show that that kid came in at a third or fourth grade level, and now they're on grade level. I think those standardized tests don't account for all the growth that actually happens from kid to kid. Um, like I said, I was having a great conversation with the instructional facilitator at my school a couple of days ago, and we were talking about just test scores and basically this topic. And she goes, yeah, I know the student got a two on her EOG, but she's like, she could barely write a paragraph or a couple sentences at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, she was writing two, three paragraphs and they were coherent and she was getting better with grammar. So yeah, she didn't do well by the state standard, by that standardized test standard, but that student grew. And I think that student grew exponentially. And just because a, a test doesn't show that that student grew does not mean that teacher did not do their job. If you're growing a student from where they were at the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and you can show that, and you know that, it could be socially, could be emotionally, could be Again, we could have gotten that student support that's help out what's going on at home and still may not do well in the test. But you know what? If that student is got a roof over their head, they're eating now, things are going good, they got all the support they need. And just because they didn't do well in the test, that student grew again exponentially. So I don't think it accounts for the standardized tests don't account for the growth that, in my opinion, matters. I want to see where the student was at the beginning of the year see how they grew as a whole student or a whole child as a whole person. Um, that's the growth I care about. So if we're going to keep these standardized tests, which again, I don't know if they're going anywhere anytime soon. Um, we need to, again, show respect to the teachers. There's growth happening in these schools. I saw it, like I said, in the title one school, students were growing left and right, but the test didn't always show it. The SAT score didn't always show it. The ACT score didn't always show it. Like I said, I had a couple basketball players who did not great on the ACT or SAT, but when I saw them as freshmen to seniors, I'd bet every dollar I got and put that kid in college and they would do just fine. I bet every dollar I got and they had to go to a community college, which I'm glad they did because they weren't going to go. I think the community colleges in North Carolina are incredible. They have great relationships with the high schools. They provide a lot of opportunities for a lot of students here in the state. Um, they had to go to the community college route just to prove that they could handle college. A couple of them went on to play college basketball. A couple of them just went to college, got four-year degrees, doing great. Um, but the test held them back. And I would have bet every dollar I'd ever made in my life that from where they were as a freshman to where they were as a senior, I, I would have bet every dollar that they could have gone to a four-year four -year school right away and done just fine in class, otherwise on the court, on the field, whatever it is. So, again, I, I think maybe some of the larger SAT, ACTs maybe put up walls. For some students, um, one of the things that we did at the school I was at before Reedy Creek is looked at test equity and just tests in general. Um, there was a test that we were looking at and the, the word hors d'oeuvres was on there. Well, we all know that word does not sound like how it's spelled on paper. So if a student comes from a background where that's not a word that's used or read, I mean, that student's going to look at that question and say, OK, I'm going to skip this or I'm just going to pick a random answer. So I, I think we need to be smart about how we test our students. I think we need to be intentional about how we test our students. And I think we need to be realistic about the stakes we place on these standardized tests and understand that if we're going to hold teachers accountable for these scores, we also have to respect the teachers enough to understand that just because the test score didn't pan out, that student still grew. That's, that's good. That's, that's very, that's very, very, very good. I think nobody's ever wanted that detail. When it comes to standardized testing, I think we heard standardized testing, but not to that degree. Um, I really like the breakdown as far as being very intentional with with your students. I think that was key. Um, and then the other one was um, not being able to see the growth in the student. Um, I think people forget that um, just just by the way things are. 
And I also think a big a big deal is I just when it comes to ACT and SAT, I think the way the it's set up, like I can remember making the 18 and I only did well in two or three sections and I made an 18. So I just think like it, it, it has to be, I don't know, but they supposed to be doing away with that or waiving that this year anyway. I have a few students because um, I coach basketball. I'm at Tyner Academy in Chattanooga. Um, I'm the assistant there. So I have a few students that play ball that's going to go to college and they're trying to waive that. So well, we'll I see. Think the big, I think the big thing is, man, how – and you guys may have had this happen in your life, but how many people took a chance on us at some point? I yeah. mean, it, I'm glad they're waving it because let the, let the colleges, let the students speak for themselves, do the interviews if you have to. I mean, I was 28 years old when the prince I work for now decided to take a chance on me. He could have picked from anybody. I mean, we're in the biggest district in the state, one of the biggest in the nation, we're the top magnet school. He could have picked anybody, but he took a chance on a 28 year old and I work twice as hard because I don't want him to be proved wrong because he hired me when I was in my 20s. And I, that's why I said earlier, I would have taken a chance on any of those basketball players who didn't do well in the SAT or ACT. They would have done just fine. They are doing just fine in college. And all you need is a chance. I love it. So let me, let me, I got two questions, but let me ask you this first one. So if, so you said, removing standardized testing, what would you put in replace of that? Well, I think I'm a big proponent of project-based learning. PBL is something that I am passionate about, and it's not perfect either, but I would rather see, and this would be almost the, the federal government giving some of that freedom to states and states giving it to school districts, but putting it in the hands of the educators who know what their students can do or create a common rubric or assessment tool across states or districts. Uh, let the students create something. Yes, is it more difficult to grade? Absolutely. But I'm, again, you guys know this, you've been in schools. Some of our students, some of our young people can create. They can create beautiful things. They may not be able to tell you what they know. They may not be able to write down what they know. They may not be able to get up in front of a class and give a speech about what they know. But give them a the freedom to create something they're gonna show you what they know. Like our school is huge on coding. We got kids that can code and create video games. Our kids are programming robots and drones. I mean, our kids are doing amazing things. And most of our teachers give our kids freedom to do what they want, like to, cre to create, just create. We get kids doing stop motion. We get kids that are literally creating movies and videos through coding. Like I would love for, students to be able to show what they know through what interests them and again there would be all kinds of logistics and red tape through the government that i mean again whoever grades these things it would be difficult to do but i'm a big proponent of students showing what they know because it doesn't always have to be a test i love that i love that i love that i love that my second question what are some best strategies for anybody um, that's looking to get into being becoming an assistant principal or administration, right? Like I know we talked early on, you were saying your priorities are getting into the classroom, supporting teachers and things of that nature. What are some best strategies that assistant principals uh, could use for our people that work uh, that work in the administration field so that that way they could better support the teacher um, and make a better effort with connecting and building that relationship? Yeah, and we talked about it. I was hired as an assistant principal really, really young. Um, and my admin team, are they're unbelievable. Um, I think the biggest thing I would tell another administrator who's new to being an administrator is lean on the people who've been doing it. Ask them questions. And it's okay not to have all the answers. I get asked a million questions a day, and I may have just the answer for a few of them. But I know who to reach out to to get the answers. Like I said, I handle transportation for the school. I get asked questions all the time, and I have sometimes no answers, but I know who to contact that will help me. So don't be afraid to say, you know what, let me get you the answer. I'll get back to you. I'll follow up with you. Um, I, I think it's a big one. And I think to support teachers, you got to let teachers lead. Sometimes, and, and I, my school is amazing at this, we get out of the way. you gotta, you got to get out of the way sometimes. Just because a teacher creates something for the school or does something for the school and it's not exactly how you wanted it doesn't mean it's wrong just because it's not what you visioned it being doesn't mean it's wrong sometimes 
and this I think this is true of all leaders, you got to get out of the way of your people. If you have teachers that have the capacity and the ability to lead and you trust them, show them that you trust them. Let them lead. Um, I think administrators need to let teachers lead professional development. Uh, I see schools all the time on Twitter paying thousands of dollars outsourcing professional development. And yeah, some of them are amazing. Some have skill sets that some teachers don't have. But if you've got people in your building who are doing great things, let them show what great things they're doing. Don't pay thousands of dollars to have somebody come in and train your staff when you've got people who are the experts in it. That, that'll shut the staff down quick. I mean, there's always, I mean, teachers all the time sit in professional development led by these people who get brought in and they're like, I already do this. I can do this. Show me something new. Um, trust your people, let your people lead. And if you have teachers who may be the quiet teacher who doesn't want to lead, make sure you don't let them become alienated and sit in their classrooms and don't keep picking the same leaders all the time. Um, pick those people who may be a little bit more creative, let them hop on with a PTA. That's still a leadership position. It's just a different kind. I think that teachers have many skills across many different areas. That's why I said administrators need to get out of the way sometimes. If a teacher comes to me and says, hey, I wanna assume a leadership responsibility. Well, let's talk about it. Let's see what you wanna do. And if there's something I can do or I have to talk to the principal or another AP about getting you that position or that role, then we'll have the conversation about it. But trust your people, get out of the way. It's okay not to have the answers and lean on those people who know better I mean, don't don't be a shut in. Lean on other schools, lean on other uh, assistant principals. Like I said, nine o'clock at night, two nights ago, I called one of my AP friends at uh, another high school and we talked for a half hour because I just didn't know the answer to something. And he bailed me out. He was willing to take that time with me. So um, like I said, trust your people. Just be there for everybody. I love that. 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 That's amazing. Um, Seth, so can you tell... Um, our listeners and uh, people, how they can get in contact with you uh, before we get out of here? Yeah, the easiest way to get a hold of me um, is through my email address because it goes right right to my personal phone. I know it's a bad habit, but I like to be accessible to everybody. Uh, my email address is s-w-a-r-r-e-n at w-c-p-s-s dot net. That's the easiest and quickest way to get a hold of me and like I said, I always try to get back to people in 24 hours. If you take the time to reach out to me, I'll take the time to respond to you. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And listen, guys, y'all heard what he said. Listen, Seth was dropping some gems. He's in the 14th largest school district in the nation. There's over 130,000 schools in America. All right, guys, listen, the 14th largest school district in the nation, and he's at a magnet, a magnet school. One of the and he worked at and he worked at Title One and he worked at a yes. Title One too. Yes. So he's he's very diverse. He's vers he has shows that he has versatility as well for the listeners out there, the principals and people that know that he's been on both sides as well. Yep. Absolutely. And so one of the best magnet school magnet schools in the country. All right. All right. But before we get out of here, can you leave our listeners with some motivation, man? Just some encouraging words, motivate our people before we get up out of here. Education, man, you can't be selfish. That is the biggest thing that I want to share with every educator. Don't be selfish. Check that ego at the door. Ask for help. We're in this together. Educators need to support each other. We know what's going on in education. We know people aren't paid what they should be. We know every day is difficult. But if an educator is driving home in tears, call an educator friend. Send an email. Send a text. You shouldn't have to feel like you're alone in this. It's a tough job. Like I said, you can't pour from an empty glass. So. If your glass is full, you can't pour into your kid's glass the next day. Uh, take care of yourselves. Don't be selfish. Reach out to the people who care about you. Reach out to the people who support you. Teachers need to support teachers. We need to be each other's biggest cheerleaders. I love when I scroll through Twitter and see teachers shouting out other teachers, administrators shouting out other administrators. Be everybody's biggest cheerleader. Because like I said, there's no, trophies. there's no trophies in this. I'm not, I'm not in this for the trophies, but I've met thousands of educators that are not in this for because the, there is none. Our trophy is seeing a kid be successful. So check that ego. Just do your best every day for the kids. Um, build the relationships with the families. That, that's huge. They'll be your biggest ally. Um, but like I said, just do right by kids. Work hard and uh, lean on each other. We got to have each other's backs. I love that. Hey, listen, guys. He said 
check the ego, don't be selfish and reach out to other teachers and things of that nature. So make sure that you are reaching out to other teachers because you cannot pour from an empty cup, all right? And support one another, all right? Support is so, 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 so important. And at the end of the day, like he said, we are in this for the babies. We are in this for the scholars. We are in this for the students, all right? And so if that is the case for you, then make sure that you leave the door open for somebody else that's in the education space. All right. So listen, guys, before we get up out of here, I want to give Seth, man, listen, I want to give you your flowers right now before we get up out of here. Um, I want to say thank you, man, for coming on to the show. Thank you for answering the calling to be um, an educator, to be a bat, to being a coach, to being an administrator. Like, thank you so much, man. Our, our babies need this and they need you and what you do matters. And so I just want to say that I want to give you your flowers and honor you in that. So again, thank you so much. Um, and listen, guys, this is the class and session podcast. All right. I am your host. Before we get out of here, I am your host, Logan Taylor, my amazing co-host, my partner, my brother in crime, Mr. Dante Hampton. And we had our special guest, Mr. Seth Warren. And like we always say in closing, why be normal? When you can be extraordinary. Hey, man, we'll see y'all soon. All right, peace. Thank you. Peace. Thank you.